Good, uh, good afternoon. For me, it's, uh, it's a little bit amusing, but also extraordinary uh, moving to present my husband here, uh, Norman Foster, uh, and uh, do the launch of uh, the four volumes, uh, the two volumes that prepared in three years with uh, Philip Giodillo. Uh, Norman, as you all know, is an architect who has been in practice for over 60 decades. Six decades. <laughs> <laughs> I know I'm so, old, but not I that old. We continue to work, so it's not uh, surprising that uh, that, that uh, kind of uh, confusion and mistake has happened to me because. Uh, for all normal human beings, it's very difficult to follow you. Yeah. <laughs> and, and keep the, keep That's the, true. Uh, anyway, uh, Norman uh, decides uh, with uh, Philip Giodidio uh, to cope uh, with the immense amount of work that he has done in different practice uh, from uh, the 60s until now and also looking at the future. Uh, who could be the author that could work with him? Uh, Norman thought that Philip Giodidio would be the most uh, complementary for his way to cope with work in architecture due to the background and also the empathy that Norman had always with Philip. Philip Giodidio uh, worked for 20 years in Connaissance des Arts. Connaissance des Arts. Connaissance des Arts as a director. Uh, was a, this publication, as many of you uh, know, was a, a, and continue to be, but not as much as when your father and you uh, founder and director the publication, a point of reference, an icon in the well of art. And uh, afterwards, he became a writer and uh, he is the most prolific and most insightful writer on architecture of our times. So he has published anywhere he is anyone in the well of architecture, deep monographies, and also a really wide way to, inter to, to understand the work of the, the number one in the, in the, of our times, from Tado Ando to Nouvelle to many, many, many others. And you become friends of them as you become closest friends, not only Norman, but also the family, because we have spent three years with the shadow and the ghost of uh, <laughs> the behind us in any no. house, any place, any country that we have been with our family. Uh, restlessness with a great generosity, with a great patience, because one of the great uh, qualities, but also uh, difficult issue with Norman is never is satisfied. So when everything, Confirm. Philip thought everything was done, no, Norman <laughs> will begin again. So uh, they, uh, Philip also, um, uh, loves and knows the Engadin, where Norman spent part of the year, and where really he concentrates in writing. And because you also love the Engadin and feel very mm. close to the Engadin, uh, has been a great, uh, a great pleasure and also a great adventure in uh, winter, summer, autumn, and, and spring to go through. Yes, absolutely. I couldn't believe when the volumes arrived home because I thought we will have to wait until other 60 years from now. <laughs> but they are there, and uh, we, we are extremely grateful to Tachin, and maybe to Benedict Tachin, that we went and we stayed with him in Los Angeles four weeks ago, and um, four, years, four, four weeks ago, and he has been, he has been a friend for many years, 
and was as enthusiastic as the first time that he began to sell Tereos and, and many other things in Venice Beach and met first of all in, in, in Germany. And he, he has been a great uh, supporter through all these years. So I give the, the microphone up. Well, we, we have, we're have wide up. We have so our own. We're we are going to have no question and answer, but in conversation, uh, in half an hour, 40 minutes. And after, all of you are completely free to, to ask or Philip or Norma about any inside <coughs> question or, or doubts that you could have. Thank you very much for being here in this amazing, <coughs> most sunny, uh, early evening and be with us in Ivory Press. <laughs> Elena, thank you very much. I, I hardly know what to say after that. Uh, you're, you're very kind and, and generous, as you, as you said. So, as, as Elena said, I have been involved in a good number of books about architecture, a number of monographs. I've worked with Tashin since the early 1990s. And in fact, we, we worked on a smaller uh, Tashin book in the mid-90s, 97, I think it was, on the work of, of Lord Foster. And uh, so now the occasion arose again. Uh, I think it was in 2018. Uh, and it was made clear to me that there might be a possibility for a monograph, which is something that I had been contacting the office about for, for a number of years. I don't know if you know that. <laughs> and uh, so Lord Foster asked me to come and talk to him about about book. Now, Tashin publishes a number of these, um, there we go, uh, a, a number of these monographs. And they've for a time, they've been rather large, rather large. So I, I went in the expectation that we would do something in the nature of what Tashin had published in the past. Uh, these are books for the general public. They're not uh, specialized books, and yet we aim to have them uh, as uh, accurate and as authentic as possible, shall we say. So we got into conversations, and um, this book, which in a typical fa fashion of Tashin might have been done in six months, took four years, four years to do, and this, I think, is, is uh, very much, if not entirely, first of all, the result of the body of work that we have tried to put into this two-volume book, 1,064 pages, 9.7 kilos, if you can imagine. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so the, the book is evolved out of conversations with Lord Foster and in terms of making lists, the lists which are the projects that we want to have in this book, which are the projects that are closest to his heart that he was most directly involved in. And Lord Foster decided very early on that this would be a, a process that would involve all of his practices, the offices before Foster and Partners, as well as Foster and Partners, which, which made it very wide ranging. So in, in the way I received our conversations, it seemed to me that I had gotten involved uh, not in a book project, but in a, in a building, a skyscraper. Uh, it, is, it, is, it, is my feeling accurate that you approach this book in some senses the way you do uh, a building? Uh, it's an iterative process. It's one of coming back on things very often, of correcting, and then, in this case, expanding. Maybe not all your buildings expand that much, but <laughs> isn't it, wasn't it a little bit like a building? Mm, I think it was a, a design project. <clears throat> Um, I think that uh, I'd like to amplify what Elena was what was saying. I mean, um, you, you, you were, for me, a creative force on the book because not only was your patience infinite, I think <laughs> you probably never expected the book to appear at all. Oh, because, no, no. Yeah. But, <laughs> because it was... Uh, um, so I think I stretched your your patience, um, but it was I think very much your encouragement. So if I had an idea, and this also I think um, the Tashan monograph, which is hugely impressive, is is is, is very much um, a, a 
there's an established format. Yes. So that's it. I never expected that if I challenge that and and in effect tried to create with you with Fernando uh, collaborating designer um, something completely different and then getting carried away with the idea of not just the traditional monograph that would show the buildings but perhaps a second volume that would uh, go in other directions all perhaps related in the sense that everything is connected. Um, and so I, I, I think there, there was a, an encouragement to yeah. explore and do some things which hadn't been done before. So it, it ended up being, uh, I think, quite a mammoth project, but it was also, uh, I think, very revealing for all of us. Yeah. It, um one thing that struck me was the way in which you got involved, which perhaps was a bit related to COVID. We were both in Switzerland, difficult to move at that time. And I think perhaps you spent more time on it than maybe you would have originally been able to uh, because of your other obligations. And what one thing that struck me was how you engaged in it in a way that I had not at all expected, which is to say you sketched almost every double page of the book not once, but several times in many mm -hmm. cases. And uh, it, it, that whole process is what perhaps made me think of, of building, of architecture. Because you, normally the subject of a book doesn't sketch every double page of, the, of his own book, as it were. No, I, th I, I think the process was very similar to designing uh, a building, designing anything. Um, there are a series of sketches. The sketches become repetitive, you, uh, you explore something, you realize that you can perhaps improve it. Um, and in a way, uh, a, a building perhaps tells many different stories. And the layout, uh, we began to realize, had the capability of telling more than just the building as it was, um, but to somehow capture the roots of the earlier, to, sh to reveal the process of design, as well as the, uh, the drawings and the photographs of the, of the finished building. So, um, so yes, it, it, it was very much a design process. I think that, um, as, as you say, the, it, the, the, a major part of it was during the period of COVID. Yes. So there was, um, being in one place was, was hugely advantageous mm. uh, rather than uh, moving around. So, uh, and, um, and, and I think uh, the, the, it, they will appear in the archive. Uh, there, are, there must be hundreds and hundreds of overlays of, of, your sketches. The, of, of, of the page layouts. Yes. Because you, you would do the sketch and then you sent, I think, photos to the designer, Fernando, and uh, that's how the book actually took form. Mm. It really was your impetus. That, and, and another thing that astonished me was your ex extraordinary grasp of the images that exist. Because we would come up across with a double page and uh, some photos had been proposed maybe uh, by, by some of the people who helped on, on, that, on that aspect. And you would say, oh, there's this photo that's better and it's never been published. And, and this was, uh, I, I think that that's an important element of your, your creativity in general. It's your, your, grasp, your, me, your grasp, your memory of what, what are details but make up a whole. I, I think also the um, other individuals, observers have picked up bringing a, a body of work over a long period of time and going back into student days and seeing some of the links between student projects and projects that would appear, say, uh, 20 or 30 years later, mm -hmm. you would see similar forms or the connections perhaps between a, a project done at Yale University as a student that sought to explore a different approach to an office building instead of a central core, putting it alongside the, the space and then um, 
uh, as one uh, dean of a school of architecture noted, uh, the Hong Kong Bank had its roots in, in that project. So, uh, so really scanning over that, that period of time was an opportunity to see those links mm. and, to, uh, and to record them. You, you use the word roots uh, for, for the Yale building is, is connected to Hong Kong. Uh, that's the title of one of your essays for the second volume. And I, I must say, I agree with the, uh, the director of uh, architecture at the Saint Pompidou, Frédéric Migaerou, who was the, the curator for your exhibition there. He said he feels that that book in particular, with your text, will remain as a reference to contemporary architecture for many, many years, for a long time to come. So I, it's, um, I, I think it's something that came naturally out of your reflection on how you would do a book like this. That was also unexpected, the essays. Why the essays all of a sudden? Well, again, I think that there was, um, an, a, in, in our conversations together, you encouraged me to, um, to talk about uh, the work with, with artists and, yes, oh yes, well. and to separate that out. Uh, and, um, and then uh, we, we talked about the indirect connections with, with flight. Um, uh, also, our shared kind of love of the Engadine and the inspirational effects of, of, of that and observations about the vernacular, the traditional architecture. And, um, and I was fascinated as a student and would literally draw measured drawings on site of traditional buildings and kind of architecture without architects, anonymous uh, architecture. So the book became, in, in some ways, particularly the second uh, volume networks. called Networks. Um, it, it, it became a, a kind of visual research project and, and also became an opportunity to, to bring together images which had uh, inspired me over, over many de decades and to, and to connect everything together. So, uh, um, so it was, uh, it's been quite a, quite a challenge and quite, uh, I think quite a for, project. For those who do go through these thousand some odd pages or, or even a good part of them, th those connections, those networks, the connections that you make between as you said, flight or art. These are not common ideas, as far as I've been able to appreciate, of architects to, to bring somehow, to bring art, to bring flight, to bring uh, alpine imagery into their architecture. But this is all part of the way you work, isn't it? This, this weaving together, which you called networks for the second volume. That's, would you accept that that's an unusual way of working? It's not something that I see very often in any case. Um, well, I think that we are all the subject of influences, whether those influences are individuals who've touched us. They might have been teachers, they might have been people who um, engendered our respect for some act, for a philosophy, or there might be everyday objects, there might be things which uh, are buried in our subconscious and other aspects which are much more kind of up, up front. So I think, in a way, acknowledging those and celebrating them. And uh, if, for example, one enjoyed the work of a graphic artist of, um, of an inspirational aircraft, then uh, we had the luxury of indulging in that, giving it a full page spread. Mm -hmm. And um, in the hope that perhaps uh, the, the reader might be similarly impressed by the graphic skill of the artist who'd captured the beauty of that, of that flying machine. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it's only one example of the, the many double-page uh, spreads. It was, uh, so it was, it was also a, a celebration of graphic skills of, 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 many, uh, of many mentors in, yes, in the mentors. past. And, and the way you bring things together, I think that's uh, it, it, something which, which came back to me again and again while we were working was 
your profound and very early interest in issues of sustainability, ecology, uh, call it what you will, there, there, there are various names, but you were really a, a pioneer in that area, uh, working with Buckminster Fuller, but I think even before that you, you had an interest in sustainability and in the environment. Yes, I mean, I, I, I worked with, with Fuller for the last 12 years of his life, but the influence in the, in the 60s, which was arguably the birth of the green movement it wasn't called the Green Movement at that time, but it was an awareness, perhaps, of the fragility of the planet. And that, um, I, I think it, they were simultaneous uh, events. So you had the first photographs taken by the astronauts of, of planet Earth, and you could see the mm. razor-thin protective atmosphere ar around it. And that was coincident, um, almost, I think it triggered uh, Buckminster Fuller's uh, operating manual for planet Earth. It was coincided with Rachel Carson, with writings of Stuart Brand, the whole Earth catalog. So um, it was a, a perhaps a groundswell of, of, of something that later accelerated and became very much a, um, a, a, a public awareness. At that point, it was a it was a fringe activity, but the. The projects from the very early 60s onwards were all about the, initially the conservation of nature and then the conservation of nature and energy. Mm. So how could you uh, do more with less? How could you improve a quality of life? The first projects were uh, very humble, quite small, but, um, but incredibly influential. One was a, um, an amenity center for dockers. It gave... Um, new standards for uh, a, a working class who'd suffered great injustice. So uh, suddenly we were creating with a Norwegian company with a completely different mindset, the Olsen uh, shipping line, um, uh, luxury accommodation, open offices, uh, carpet on the offices, which was uh, unheard of. and. Um, and the, uh, the canteen being more a dining room with ping pong, with darts, with, um, and, um, and bringing in new materials to, uh, to conserve energy. So it was, um, uh, yes, all those, all those threads were there. And the early projects for Fred Olson were about solar power, about desalination, about new kinds of agriculture, uh, wind power. Um, and all of this was, uh, as I was saying, was very fringe activity. Yeah, but you were, you were sensitive to it, which not everybody was, mm. <laughs> perhaps, most yes. architects. You, you, you don't want to, it, it's a, a quality which I, uh, which I uh, acknowledge and understand that you don't put yourself forward in this circumstance. You explain the, what was going on around and what emerged from it, but you're in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, 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 <clears throat> I, 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 there was um, which I refer to, I think, in in networks. There was a, um, I w was brought up through two schools of architecture. The second one at Yale, and the, um, like most schools of architecture, the idea is that the architect is the central character, and um, and in a way the. The, the other professional players who make that uh, design possible are in a kind of servant mm. role. Uh, it, it, it's, you do the design, you pass the parcel, and somebody else makes it work. Um, uh, the turning point for me was in Yale with Paul Rudolph, who was the very manifestation of the architect as the ultimate master. Um, and, um, and the project was for a tall building, and it was the one that I was referring yes. to as the uh, predecessor in some ways of the Hong Kong Bank. And I made the point that uh, how could I start to design a tall building if I didn't understand about the structure of a tall building? Needless to say, most people, I think, went back to the textbook, and it's very, very simple. The, 
there's a central core, it's a structure. Mm. You don't need anybody to tell you that, the escape <laughs> says are there. But if you try to look at something for, from, from first principles, so I made the point, I need an engineer. I need an engineer to talk to. Um, and, um, and Rudolf, to his credit, and I think this is why he was a great teacher, because he would bring people together uh, who, whose beliefs, philosophy, he didn't necessarily share, but respected. So I ended up with, with the engineer, and working together side by side, I learned uh, about the nature of the structure of a tall building. Mm. So I was empowered as a designer. I, it wasn't as if I'd lost any, uh, as if my creative endeavor had been diluted, quite the reverse. I felt you know, much stronger as a designer because I knew more about it. Mm. And it was really that turning point that, um, that has informed my, the way that I work as an, as an architect or, uh, or a designer or an urbanist, because um, the edges get blurred between these, these activities. I mean, I feed, <clears throat> I feed on the knowledge, the knowledge of how something is made by going to the factory, the, yeah. the, the, the values that might underpin an organization by talking to the people who head it out. Um, so in, in a way, the more that you know as a designer, the more effective you can be and the more powerful the creative process. Um, and perhaps it's the equivalent of a round table approach rather than the hierarchical sitting well, at like the end of the- As in uh, your office, the round table. Exactly, yes, yeah. which is a, a metaphor, but is the reality of that, of that process. And that's in a way why um, during COVID, we were uh, stretching the technology of newfound technology of Zoom, and that was absolutely amazing. But shortfall, uh, you can't be really creative, uh, you know, staring at a screen. Um, you suddenly need in, 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 in a studio by God, we need to talk to, you know, get Roger, get the engineer, <laughs> or, you know, get the guy who knows about air movement, hydraulics, you know, we need him round the table. Um, you, you, you can't do that remotely. Um, you can pretend to. Perhaps. But that's how your office in London at Foster and Partners works. Well, you that's know. how it works also in the and, foundation. And where in the earlier... Uh, it, it's exactly that, where mm. we're calling in you know, a, a, an engineer, calling in somebody who's actually making it, um, uh, whether that's a contractor, subcontractor. Mm. Uh, well, th this is um, the next step, is it, where you, you continue your activity with, with your practice, and you have extended that activity uh, to the foundation here in Madrid, uh, but which takes on many of these subjects. You just pointed out the practical aspect of calling on different types of specialists, and, but also your interest in the environment, your interest in urban development, your interest in, in as an architect, somehow contributing in a positive way to the future. That's, that's a logical step, but it's, it is a step away from the practice in a sense. Yes, it? I mean, I think that the foundation enables us to do things um, as a team which don't fit into the conventional, the traditional practice. So um, if, I, if I give one fairly obvious example, we had a workshop on refugee housing. It brought 10... Uh, graduates uh, from around the world with a similar number of experts. Um, and we connected uh, via Zoom with the United Nations on site in, I think it was Libya. Um, uh, we had people who uh, had developed a more sophisticated form of tent as, as, a, as a group. We erected the tent in the, in the courtyard. Um, this was super sophisticated. It had a life of three years as opposed to the one-year life of t traditional tent. Um, and so we're working through uh, with the student group. And, uh, and at the end of this workshop where they're presenting their, their teamwork, the underlying theme is essentially challenging 
how can you be talking about a refugee camp where somebody is going to be spending an average of 17 years and you give them a, a, a tent which has a one-year life and is a thin piece of fabric and even the one in the courtyard which was developed with, with IKEA and is a very noble work. I mean, it uh, elevates the status of the tent, but it's still you know, a fabric with no, with no windows, with all the problems of, uh, of something which, uh, it, it, in the event of a storm or yeah, weather, privacy is, uh, is pretty horrific. Um, and so out of this came, why can't, why, why can't we build something which is more durable, permanent, and do it quickly. Uh, why can't, okay, you can put a tent up in, in 24 hours. Why, what if you allow yourself three days? What could you do? And so that was left hanging. And then the sponsor of that, uh, of that workshop came back and said, what if in the, this, the workshop was in June, in August, came back and said, what if you try and prove as a, as a group, um, as a project group within the foundation, um, uh, uh, demonstrate the feasibility of that idea with the pavilion uh, to coincide with the opening of the Venice Biennale. Right. And all that, all that philosophy of working with industry, working with a contractor. So the first thing we did with me, engineers, contractor, um, and, and out of this evolved something, as we know, mm. is in, in, in Venice. And you know, everybody who's seen it says, wow, I'd love to stay in it. I'd love one of those on a beach. <laughs> so, um, so something that would be costing uh, you know, affordably, perhaps, I don't know, 20, anything between four and 20,000, depending on the size and the facilities, and can be built in three or four days. And, and used um, completely new technology. I mean, used a canvas with a low carbon cement impregnated, which when you uh, draped it over a form and you sprayed it with water would go hard mm. uh, within a few hours and 24 hours would be structurally rigid and, um, and very beautiful. So, mm. um, so uh, again, the foundation is is rooted in those multidisciplinary uh, principles and has been able, I think, um, in informal settlements to see a transfer over a one-year period from uh, open bathrooms on a beach to modern sanitation. Um, uh, those are not things that traditional practice can, can do, but, um, but working together with sponsors and students, um, many things are possible. You've emphasized uh, a good deal the, uh, as it were, the art of making things by bringing people together, by uh, uh, confronting different points of view, and I think of, of listening also, which is something that I uh, must thank you for and uh, was an unexpected uh, um, aspect of working with you. You, you listen, and then you make your decision, of course. Nobody expects it to be contrary, but not everyone in your position listens. Do they? Especially architects who take themselves for, for great Well, it's geniuses. interesting. I'm always um, exhorting to colleagues and younger colleagues, younger graduates coming into the practice that you have to be a good listener. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and um, no, it is a, a kind of personal mantra. And um, you have to listen to as many voices as possible. Um, but I think that is in the spirit of how you empower yourself, whether uh, you're leading a team or, or whatever it is, uh, it's challenging convention. Um, uh, but it is, uh, no, I mean, I, I, I don't know any other way of, of functioning it, as, it comes a, naturally as a to designer. You. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, but also the, uh, connecting the dots, as it were, connecting your early work, as we do in this, we attempt to in this book, to what you're doing with the foundation. There is an emphasis on, a constant emphasis on the user, what the comfort of the user, perhaps, or the, um, the fact that, that buildings are going to be used by real people, as opposed to some 
modern architecture, I'm not going to name any names, but that uh, are more cold gestures than they are actual buildings for people. You're, you're, what you do is for the people who, who will use them. I think, I mean, in the end, it's, it boils down to, I think, some uh, simplicities. It is about the quality of life and the power of, of design to improve the quality of life uh, of, of all of us. And I think that technology has always been the means to that end. And that's why perhaps I'm attracted to certain writers who have a historical overview mm -hmm. and um, and do demonstrate that uh, uh, we, uh, whatever we may read in the newspaper and whatever uh, horrible things might be happening not too far away by way of wars or famines or, uh, or fires or plagues, the, the overall big picture is one of social progress and, and technology is, is, is behind that. And, um, and technology is not something new. I mean, the technology that created uh, a soaring medieval cathedral, we probably couldn't do that now in stone. Uh, maybe we could, but we'd have to have some pretty radical rethinks. Um, uh, so technology is, is not new. Technology has been there since we came out of the cave. Mm. Um, uh, but it has been seen as something cold and, and efficient and distant. Uh, you've approached technology, even in the objects you like, like the DC-3, or other, you've approached technology as, as something more uh, human than many people. You, you, your work was called high-tech at a certain point. Uh, that's you know an old term by now, and maybe applied at the time of the Hong Kong and Shanghai Bank or others. But that high technology was always at the service of people who were using the building, I think. And it was, it's always and still is. Yeah. Um, uh, I mean, there's always the flip side of, 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 of any technology. I mean, um, uh, the, the vaccines which, uh, which save us from cholera and the plague and, and have countered um, uh, COVID, uh, I mean, those, that, that same technology can create biological warfare. So there's always, there's always two, two sides to that. Uh, the safest form of energy, nuclear, of course, also produced the nuclear bomb. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but statistically, you know, that is... That, uh, so, uh, so there's always the two, the two sides of, of, of any of these aspects. Uh, perhaps just one, one last question. Um, uh, uh, one thing I asked you, I think the last time I, I saw you for, for an interview, um, was about the size of your office. Because I met you in the 90s and you were already, there were a lot of people, I don't remember the exact number, but now there are over 2,000 people, I believe, working for Foster and Partners. And uh, I, I asked you about what drove you to continue to make the office large, larger, and you said something about the challenge, I think. The challenge of new projects, the challenge of what's out there, the next, the next thing that you can design. What, what has driven you to make your office so large? Well, I think it's, an, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a practice which has evolved over some six decades. So it is a, it, it, it's, it's a team and it's continually fed by, by new talent, by by top graduates. There's a very strong underlying philosophy. Uh, um, the number, you can probably just half that in terms of architects and the other half yes. are the other disciplines supporting Necessary. them. And then um, uh, I've done a conscious piece of design which is to break down the larger uh, entity into smaller studios. So mm. in that sense, um, it it's retains the flexibility and the more personal aspects. But in the end, um, I suppose it's the frailty of human nature. If somebody offers an exciting project, it's oh. difficult to say no. <laughs> 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 the difficulty of saying no. <laughs> Um, I think perhaps questions. Thank you very much. Yes. Uh, Thank you very much. Um, if, uh, Online with the, with the uh, next challenge. 
do you have any specific particular design challenge for the future that you haven't tackled yet and you would like to? Basically, your next. Um, <laughs> um, type of. I think the, the, the opportunity perhaps to demonstrate the potential of producing high quality mass housing at a very affordable level to somehow break through that, that barrier. And a lot of people have tried to do that. I don't think anybody's really succeeded. I think that um, the inequality in terms of access to affordable housing um, is complex and it has a political land value element to it. So it's not just the cost of the, the building hardware, but I think that is uh, a significant aspect of it. Um, the, uh, the foundation is working with a consortium in Portugal um, and with a very serious government-aided program to look at modular prefabrication. As I say, this is a recurring theme in architectural history. So um, many, many designers have tried this uh, before. But I'm very optimistic on that. But I think it is... It, it would be cracking the affordable housing and demonstrating. And in a way, that was the excitement of this project that I was talking about for refugee housing. I think some of the best designs have come out of very, very tight constraints. I mean, that little pavilion in Venice has, uh, is, is really the, probably the, the tightest budget that you've ever worked with. The only project that I can think of that had a even skinnier budget was um, a very early project for temporary office accommodation. And, um, and that's going back to the early 1970s. And it was an inflatable building used as an office, which had never been used as an office uh, before. And, um, and that, I remember, was 15 shillings a square foot. So that was what? Uh, uh, <laughs> No, three much. quarters of a euro. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have another question. Hi, Laura Costa. Um, joining with the same question about the future of our cities, how do you see the regeneration and bringing to new life all this historic fabric of our European cities, worldwide cities? How do you see that problem to be solved in the future? I, I, I think that um, the that there needs to be a more global acceptance and awareness that the most desirable cities where people flock to because they want to establish their bring up a family or they want to visit it on holiday are all of a particular kind of city. They're all compact and they're walkable. Um, that, I think, is a lower energy model. And then you have to uh, somehow connect the different elements within a city administration um, so that they're working holistically, so that the people who are handling waste don't see it as uh, their mission to do landfill, but rather they're working with the people in the administration who are responsible for energy so that you're converting waste to energy. You can do some of these things at scale and at the scale of a, of, of a city. And then I, I think looking dispassionately um, and, and taking the emotion out of it in terms of what are the sources of, 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 of clean energy. Um, so I think it is... Uh, it, it, it's a wider air awareness of the different aspects. This would lead us to a conversation about the Institute, which is an offshoot of the foundation, is creating uh, a series of one-year courses um, which, com which will combine uh, academia with the scholars working with the, the administration within uh, uh, a small number of cities, three cities. So um, 
I think it is, it is about education and, and, and awareness to move um, societies to a more circular economy rather than one which is about consumption and waste. I also think that um, unlike so many kind of prophets of doom, that we don't have to metaphorically tighten our belts, quite the reverse. I think that our, our, our thinking is not surprisingly confined to our rather small part of the Western world. Mm. The reality is that all the action, all the expansion, I mean, I was saying last night, and perhaps some people here were there last night, but just to give a magnitude of the urbanization that is necessary to raise the standards of those who don't have what we have in our society here and to respond to population growth. We have to create the equivalent of 17 Madrid cities uh, every, every year for the next 27 uh, years um, to cope with the growth in population to estimated 7 billion by then. Um, and and that's, that's where the action is in Asia, in, in Africa. I mean, Nigeria, by its own internal governance, has, 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 has estimated that by 2050, to cope with population growth and to raise its standards to those which we take for granted, the ability to throw a, a switch and have electric power, to be able to cook over... Uh, over electricity or, 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 or gas and not coal uh, or burning wood. Uh, they need, by 20, 15 times the amount of energy that they're consuming at the moment. Mr. Foster has built, uh, has designed uh, buildings everywhere in this world, but uh, beautiful buildings. And he has also designed a winery in the village where my mother was born. <laughs> and that is really uh, exciting. And when I entered that winery, I, 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 could, I couldn't believe it. it was so beautiful. I thought it, I was in a, like in a cathedral and uh, I felt a uh, huge emotion. Thank oh. you for that. Well, so Thank nice you. to hear. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> <laughs> I have a comment about your book. I have not looked at it, but I assume it's 60 years of success stories. So what I'm always interested in is, what are the failure stories? You must have in your life one or two even more failures. So that is what I would like to hear. Uh, I think we, uh, <coughs> it's impossible to, uh, um, to be probably in any profession without at some point reflecting back and thinking, oh my God. Uh, so um, I suppose you're, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm walking across, um, I'm, I've, I've taken a, a, a weekend break, I'm in, uh, in the Engadine Valley and I get a phone call uh, to say that the, the bridge across the Thames has been closed because mm. it started to wobble. Um, uh, and uh, yes, I mean, that's one of those moments yes. when you really <laughs> want the ground to open up and swallow you. And of course, that's, uh, that's hugely uh, embarrassing. Um, and everybody at that particular point is saying, um, well, as a team, they kind of got what they deserved because what they professed to create was a, a new kind of suspension bridge. It's not going up into the sky. It's essentially very low. Um, so it's respectful of the views of St. Paul's Cathedral. So it's a new way of looking at a suspension bridge and um, uh, so at that point, you're immersed in, uh, understandably and naturally and reasonably, you know, a barrage of, 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 of criticism. Um, what you then 
what we then discovered, um, but in a way, time to a degree heals, although you never forget it, and the embarrassment perhaps uh, sustains itself. But the, what we then discovered was that historically a whole number of bridges, which when they opened were not pedestrian bridges, but they were perhaps railway bridges, they had a big surge of pedestrian movement and they started to move mm. and, and ex, 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 become excited and oscillate. Um, and, um, but it was never given prominence because those were not pedestrian bridges. They were railway bridges and they would have a, a pedestrian opening event. Um, and um, to cut a long story short, what happened is that it was a relatively simple fix. Um, hydraulic dampers were attached to the underside at the ends of the bridge. You can't even see them, it's so discreet. But it made a transformational difference. And significantly, the codes on bridge construction are now different because they've recognized that. And the, 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 the lesson, I guess, is that everything that we take for granted, if there was a, a fire in, in, in a building and you ran to an escape stair and, and so on, many of the things that we take for granted have come out of trial and error. At some point, uh, somebody tragically lost them at their lives in, in a fire. I mean, last night I was talking about the importance of the lessons of history and, and aesthetics, and I showed a couple of images. And one was the Great Fire of London, and I showed the image of what London looked like before the fire, and its wooden structures and thatch. And of course, it's highly ignitable. And on the other side of the image, I showed what we take for granted as the DNA of London and its Georgian terraces. But it's easy to forget that those Georgian terraces made a brick with the invention of the party wall were all about fireproof construction. Um, uh, now, they produced a very elegant uh, architecture. But for everything that we take for granted, there's been a trial and, and error. I mean, the, you take uh, one Gothic cathedral, which has the most beautiful circular, but it's part of a cross bracing. And you realize that at some point, one of those cathedrals that didn't have that cross bracing fell down. That's lost in, in history. That particular point, they learned from that and there's a feedback loop. So, um, so I, I think that in, in, whether it's in personal learning terms or whether it's in the learning curve of society and building codes, um, I, I once kind of lectured my colleagues on the importance of failure. <laughs> um, and, and failure is important. But as you know, one sage said, um, it, the, 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 it, perhaps there's inevitability that you're going to make mistakes. What is really bad is if you don't learn from your mistakes. Brilliant. <laughs> you don't need that. <laughs> I'll turn around and thank you. <laughs> so uh, what I wanted to ask is in regards of your opinion or your view uh, regarding architecture competitions and what impact did they have or have they had in your evolution as an architect, especially as I think that maybe lately they're getting a bit of a bad reputation because well, organizations are not great or they are maybe looking for just to get like cheap uh, work or like a lot of ideas for um, and then just to hand pick whatever they want but I do get the feeling that historically they've been very important and a lot of great architecture and debates have come out of competitions so I wonder like what's your thoughts on that? my thoughts um, <coughs> I, I, I think the I don't think um, I think the, the, the competition system can take different forms. And I think that some 
projects probably lend themselves to an open competition. I think some projects lend themselves to a competition, perhaps by interview or whatever. But unquestionably, some of the greatest buildings in the world have come out of the competition process. Um, but the, the competition process is, in the end, as good as the promoters and the jury and the final decision makers. And, um, and it's, it's, a, it's a, a story that's been told many times, but, um, but the uh, Sydney Opera House, what, what apparently happened is that the jury had decided in terms of a project, which um, nobody really knows what that project looked like, but, um, but one juror was late, and it was Erosarinen, and he appeared and insisted on going through all the ones that had been rejected, and almost literally the one that had been thrown in the wastebasket was, uh, was Utzon's building that is the celebrated. That has a, a very, also a very interesting um, history about it, how it was finally maintained. So, um, so uh, there is an, an always an element of chance with with the with, with the competition system, and uh, I, I think by and large it's still the best process that we have, but not every project necessarily lends itself to that for various reasons. So um, uh, it's imperfect. Um, and uh, and I, I, I can give you examples of where the competition process has been totally corrupt. I, I mean, I can give you one e e e example of that, but I won't, it might be a bit embarrassing. But, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, but, but, but by and large, as a system, when it's well run, when it's, when it's got the right kind of, 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 of jurors. And I have, um, I've, I've sometimes been the chair of a jury on more than one occasion for major competitions. And what's always surprised me is, is that at the end, we've, we've always had a unanimous decision. Um, but, but I can give you lots of other <laughs> examples which are not so flattering, but... Uh. Thank you so much, Norman, for all the, the insights, and also to you, Philip. I want to also recognize the, the role of the designer, Fernando Gutierrez, who is here with us tonight, who has been also pivotal in the... And whose patience has yes. also <laughs> <Yeah>. been, <laughs> amazing. you know, amazing <laughs> and admirable. And Fernando calm, also, calm, you calm. know, did it for love. I it? mean... <laughs> but, but, but before we all go, and it's, uh, it has to be with your question about failure, and also about your question about, uh, with your question about competition. Uh, Norman, if you have to, if I have to uh, define your personality, uh, you are a risk taker. You cannot live without taking risk and challenge constantly in your profession. And um, in the film that uh, we published when we put on the scene several years ago, you have an interview where you were talking about the competition that you did for the Hong Kong Bank. Bank. At that time, your practice was very small. You didn't have almost any money. In fact, you are you were bankrupt, and we will not be here if you didn't win that competition. It means that uh, you always went to the age, and always continue to be, even now, in competitions that you are doing, in challenges that you are taking, in the large uh, endeavors, and also where your practice go, Constantly, you are pushing the boundaries of technology or uh, economical possibilities to enhance your way to create even better buildings, better uh, tools 
to do the architecture that you can do with your colleagues. So I would like that you, for the last time tonight, because already we are here one hour, so after that we, we congratulate you and, and, and believe for this uh, monumental volume uh, that you talk about just briefly about this kind of need to take risk to evolve, the lack of fear to failure, which I have observed in 30 years in Oman, doesn't care about failure, doesn't think about, oh, you know, in this, in this competition or in this work or, in this, or with this client, I'm going to have a very hard time or we are going to become completely uh, out of uh, out of business. That's why it's so successful. So it's a constant, constant, constant uh, taking risk, love challenge, and doesn't have fear. But I would like that you talk a bit about that because you <coughs> mainly for the this, young the, the, generation the, of architects here. This is like sort of true confessions. <laughs> um, uh, um, I remember the Sainsbury Center, um, and the, we had got the design developed. It was a portal frame, a solid structure, uh, created this um, continuous, very pure space. Um, but we tended to brush aside the realities that this uh, floor for works of art um, uh, with top light, controllable, um, was potentially a fantastic space. But when you started to put all the ancillary elements of bathrooms, of small dark rooms, of a small kitchen for a cafe, um, completely compromised it. And this was really way down the line. I mean, the project had, had gone into quite detailed development. And I suddenly, suddenly realized that if you had a deep, permeable structure, a lattice structure, that would start in the walls and form the roof, that it would absorb all these secondary functions. And it would be a real integration. I mean, it would be more economical, it would work better, you'd get more thermal insulation, it would be more sustainable, it would be more elegant. It was obvious, and I remember at that point, get, we got everybody together, and Tony Hunt, who was the engineer, who just finished the detailed drawings, and he said, Norman, it's brilliant but it's your next building. <laughs> and I said, there may not be another building. <laughs> We've got to do it. And Tony, to his credit, rather like Fernando and Philip, stretched themselves, and, and so we did that. But, but so the fee system for architecture is essentially front-loaded. So you get a large fee at the beginning. And if you're not really disciplined and you do what I've just described and you repeat and you push it, you suddenly find that you haven't got, and that's, at that time there were more than, than those projects because this is now coming to the end of the 1970s. And there are these projects going through the, the studio. You suddenly realize that you've spent most of the, of the funds, so how the hell? And so the Hong Kong bank was the potential lifeline, and it was a limited competition. Um, and um, and uh, we hadn't built anything <coughs> taller than a three-story building. That was the Willis Faber headquarters. And, um, and so it was a, a huge element of, of risk. I mean, it was staking everything and betting everything on, on that project. Now, as you say, thank goodness we, yeah, we, we won the competition and that we're, we're here to tell the tale. Um, <laughs> might have been very different if we had not. Um, so yes, I think 
it, it, it's, it's, it's pushing, it, it's, it's challenging and pushing the boundaries. But, but I, would, I, I, would, I would say that, um, that the, in, in those early days, notwithstanding the tale that I told about the suspension bridge, um, the, the, I, I, I think that the, the, you, you are haunted by risk, um, and there's a as, a, as a, as an ex-pilot, and probably I came close to being a professional pilot, although I never was a professional pilot, um, but th there's this kind of cliche, and that is that the price of safety is constant vigilance. And, I, and I'd say that um, as a designer, and I, I encourage colleagues, particularly younger colleagues, to be continuously looking over your shoulder, continuously questioning. And, and, and in a way, there's a paradox. Yes, there is this pushing the boundaries and taking the kind of risk that I've described, but you're also checking, double checking. And in some ways, in, if, if you're a younger, less experienced architect, if you're really conscientious, you're not taking anything for granted. And it's interesting that some of the aviation accidents do come out of uh, pilots who take things for granted because they've done it so many times, that they're not, they're not checklist conscious. And, and, um, and the checklist, whether it's flying an aircraft or whether it's designing a building or in a way doing anything, particularly anything that's in the public domain, you, you should be constantly checking the checklist, constantly making sure, you know, code compliance, escape stairs. And it, it's, uh, so all of that that is onerous in terms of the designer and you protest, and, and rightfully you protest some of the legislation. I mean, the legislation that, 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 that banishes industry away from residential is out of date because it doesn't recognize that much of industry today is, is clean and a, industry. And you could put it next to housing, and you can walk to to work. You don't have you don't have to banish it in planning zoning. So that's out of date zoning and should be should be challenged. So it it, it 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 it's a balance. A lot of the things that you protest are in fact very desirable safeguards, but some are out of date and need revising. You take risks, but you control the risks. Yes. Not always. <laughs> <laughs>